Recall how I treated you in similar recording sessions. You know the demands of this podcast as well as I do. But I was young and foolish, Leo. Young and brash. Never foolish. That's a very nice way of putting my audio used to be utter trash. (laughs) Brash is code for shitty audio, I think. Welcome to Gamjabar, your guide to the iconic world of Dune. We'll be exploring the themes, philosophies, and characters found in the sandy depths of this vast universe, from Frank Herbert's groundbreaking novels to the adaptations on film and TV. My name's Abu. My name is Leo. And Leo, we are back once again. Yep. Venturing 3,500 years into the future and diving back into the pages of God Emperor of Dune. What a book. (laughs) What a spectacular book. But before we talk about the reading we assigned you for today's episode, let's take care of our housekeeping. Let's make shout out Mapes proud. And hey, as usual, no spoilers Mm -hmm. beyond the pages we've talked about thus far. Indeed. And of course, at the top of the show, we want to shout out our Kwisatz Haderach level patrons, Case Aiken, Matthew Good. Fellas, even if you approached me, masks fully on, you know, in the room of anonymous figures, I would recognize you by your voice, by your actions, by your generosity, mm. even though you're masked, because it's so distinctive, so supportive, and so appreciated. Thank you. So true. Also, so take true. off your fucking mask. We, we're having a conversation here. <laughs> Make eye contact with me, God damn it! Yeah, guys, come on. <laughs> That started really wholesome, and then it went the more usual route. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Thank you so much, Case and Matthew. And that thank you extends, of course, to all of our patrons who support us and make this show possible. It's true. Well, with that out of the way, let's talk about today's episode. And y'all should know the game plan already. We're going to begin with the summary of today's chapters. We're going to dive into a couple of takeaways, and then we're going to wrap up with some mm, yummy... Mm. (laughs) spice morsels so with that out of the way let's take a quick break and right after this we'll launch into our chapter summaries welcome back folks Mm. let's dive into the reading for today starting off with chapter four let's talk about the excerpt we have normally ignored these in the past right generally because they're basically impossible to understand (laughs) until you reread the book. Yeah. But I think here in God Emperor of Dune, we already have context for these excerpts. They are mostly pulled from Leto's journals and they usually offer quite a bit of insight, whether it's literal connection to what's going to happen in the chapter or thematic connection to the ideas being explored that I think it's worth talking about a lot of these excerpts in this book. So we'll be doing a lot more of that over the course of this series. Totally. So starting off with a chapter four excerpt, this one is a translation of the stolen journals in which Leto talks about his quote unquote safaris that he takes into his ancestral memories. And he explains how he often finds himself picking a research topic like female intellectuals and then consuming basically everything there is to know in human history about it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) His bibliography list is trillions of lives long. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You just got to imagine, you're like, oh man, I hit my reading goal this year, 52 books. And he's like, impressive. I viewed 10,000 lives. (laughs) And you're like, fine. I'm not going to brag about my reading to you anymore. (laughs) Right. Leto 2's Goodreads account is off the fucking it's charts. Insane. But he keeps reviewing the authors. He never talks about the books. He's like, right, the book right. is boring. <laughs> Just constantly shit-talking the authors. And actually, speaking of shit-talking, this entry, of course, ends on Leto dunking on the reader because right. he's got to. This is Leto 2 we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. He says, quote, 
What a private joy to relive the life of such a one while I mock the academic pretensions which supposedly formed a biography. <laughs> End quote. He's so passive aggressive. <laughs> so passive aggressive. I also love that he knows in the future people will find his journals, right? right? And people will try to use the journals as a basis to understanding the God Emperor's life, right? As the basis to probably many biographies written about him. And here he is basically dunking on that fact before it even happens. No biography could ever capture the true essence of a human life, let alone the life of a godworm. <laughs> yeah. Did they write about how big I am? <laughs> I'm heavy. <laughs> well, with that little excerpt out of the way, the chapter begins with Moneo Atreides. Hey. Someone we've only seen in like a little conversation excerpt. Yeah. In the flesh, he is heading toward a meeting with Leto Atreides, who is waiting by the crumpled body of his most recent Duncan. <laughs> <laughs> Rest in peace. The third death we've seen this book. Yeah. Now, as Moneo crosses this giant room, this like crypt, this massive crypt toward Leto, we learn about Siona through Leto's thoughts, through the God Emperor's thoughts. Right. Quote, what a gift Moneo has given me in this daughter, Leto thought. Siona is fresh and precious. She is the new, while I am a collection of the obsolete, a relic of the damned, of the lost and strayed. End quote. Wow. <sighs> oh, dude. Damn. <laughs> I will say this many times. I love the voice that Leto has as he thinks mm -hmm. about things. It's mm -hmm. like so poetic. It sounds like someone who's been fucking thinking about things for 3000 years. Yeah. It's very cool. Or someone who's been on mushrooms <laughs> or, or for someone a few hours too long. <laughs> <laughs> tripping hard on psilocybin. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, there's seven Moneos. Three of them are dancing. <laughs> yeah. Also, hilarious the damned <laughs> yeah i love this quote though i mean yeah. just this idea of him being this like relic of the obsolete that he is a collection of humanity that used to exist and siona in his mind as he as leto sees it is a representation of the future of where humanity could go and what's funny is leto presumably doesn't see himself in that role Right. He's just sort of the steward that maybe transitions humanity to that future, but he sees the future of humanity in Siona, yeah. which is poignant. It's true. And also, I mean, he said it earlier in the book, right? It's the past. It's only the past, right? Like, yeah, yeah. as much value as there is in these thousands of lives and thousands of memories, it's just the past. And what matters really is the future and the golden path. Absolutely. And his musings reveal to us in this little moment that Siona may play a very critical part, as you're saying, in those future plans. Yeah. And he's watching her closely. He's like, hey, I got to keep tabs on this girl. She right, right. nearly got picked apart by wolves. <laughs> She's not <laughs> making it easy for me. <laughs> Quote, Siona was like a clean slate upon which great things might yet be written. I guard that slate with infinite care. I am preparing it cleansing it end quote <laughs> and i gotta think nearly feeding her to wolves interesting way of cleaning <laughs> interesting yeah. way of cleansing yeah yeah yeah. tough parenting style here <laughs> from leto too but also in line with some of his other excerpts where he's talking about the ease and comfort being weakening and the true cleansing is through amtal is through challenging is through adversity is through pushing against her so that she pushes back and reveals her true self. He gets rid of the, you know, ugh, stuff. Yeah. And she yeah. <laughs> she reveals herself to be what she needs to be. Absolutely. Leto knows, much like the past, the future of humanity is not going to be easy. And whoever he trains for that role to usher in that future, to represent that future, presumably right now the best candidate is Siona, that person needs to be prepared to overcome any and all challenges that totally. humanity will face. Totally, yeah. So moving on from the inner thoughts that he's having about Siona, Moneo finally arrives and consoles 
Leto for the loss of yet again <laughs> another Duncan. Yeah. This seems like a very practiced routine <laughs> at this point. This has happened many times. Yeah. They discuss Leto's wound briefly before getting down to the business of running the empire. First, Leto's like, hey, the guildsman that warned me about the Ixian Lays gun that Duncan had, give him 10 grams of spice for his service. He offered up some intel. He deserves a reward. Tiny aside here, I think it's fascinating that this is an example. We start to see how Leto is on top of things. We see the spy yeah. networks. We see the bribes. We see the people uh, trying to get spice the way we write about already. And we know Leto has prescience. And many mm. people go, he's not using it. I can't believe he's not using it. He's got that power. Why isn't he using it? And then Leto tells us, I don't fucking use it. <laughs> I don't use it because it's dangerous. Right. And then we see he knew about the laser gun in the bag, not because of prescience, not because he was you know, using the power like Muad'Dib did. Totally. He knew it because someone was like, I'm going to get some spice. So it's like, this is such a beautiful show don't tell little moment. I love it. Yeah. Great observation. So moving on from the guildsmen, the next topic that they touch on is Moneo's daughter herself, Siona. And here is where we learn a major detail about Siona that Leto actually keeps to himself for the time being. He wonders if he should tell Moneo, and then he decides it's best to keep this under wraps. Quote, Siona could fade from prescient view at times. The golden path remained, but Siona faded. Yet, she was not prescient. She was a unique phenomenon. End quote. <laughs> oh my God. Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Because <laughs> we know from Dune Messiah, Children of Dune, from the previous books, prescient beings can't see other prescient beings. Right. That was the whole purpose of having... Edric in on the plot to kill Monty. <laughs> yeah, putting up with you Edric. <laughs> that was like, the cause. You put up with Edric because he's a prescient being. He'll create a blind spot for Muad'Dib. <laughs> Siona here is not prescient. Right. Yet, she is flickering in and out of Leto to Atreides' godlike prescient visions? Enormous. That's yeah. like a bombshell reveal that Leto casually thinks about in this conversation <laughs> with yeah. Monea when they're conducting the business of running an empire. Hilarious. <laughs> and actually, before we can even ponder about the implications of this bombshell, we also learn from Moneo that he has an agent within Siona's rebellion, our guy Topri. There's a reason Nela didn't trust him. Right. And we learn that Moneo himself at one point was a rebel. He himself had a rebellious phase before serving the god emperor and now becoming one of his most trusted aides. This is one of two things that I feel like I totally missed the first time I read this book. Yeah. Like I totally 100%. missed that he had a rebel face, that he like went through the same beats that Siona mm -hmm. did. The second thing I missed is reading the description of, I always picture Moneo as like a nerd. <laughs> I don't know why. Oh, He's yeah. like a, a squeamy little, little guy, just a little guy, yeah. you know? Like reading the descriptions of him, I'm like, Wait, is Moneo hot? Can Moneo, Moneo is fucking definitely get it? Hot. He's hot, right? <laughs> <laughs> I totally missed this the first time. I was picturing this, but they were talking about his like piercing gray eyes and his like. I was yeah. like, Oh my god! Oh, you know he's like a silver fox. You know oh, he's got totally. that. Yeah, Moneo, hundred percent certified hot. <laughs> he's like Anderson Cooper, but like intimidating, or yes. more intimidating. I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> Totally. 100%. That's a great image. I also think Moneo, what makes him hotter yeah. is the fact that he could fuck and chooses not to. Hey, true. You know right? Because <laughs> my understanding so far of what we know from Moneo is yeah. that he married once, yeah. had Siona, right. and presumably lost his wife at some point, and has ever since basically served the god emperor and right. done his job. Leto He's thinks, a company man. Man, I wish he gave me more kids. <laughs> yeah. And Moneo's yeah. like, too bad. I could have. I'm above all of that. <laughs> <laughs> too bad I'm too good for everyone. <laughs> Damn. Moneo has transcended hotness. I'm hot. <laughs> 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 oh, 
I, I don't know. It, it's just interesting to think about these things that I didn't yeah. really pick up the first time. Totally. Well, so they talk about rebellions. They talk about the quality of rebellions and how they interact with government. And in kind of a cute little moment, Monet was kind of skeptical about like, Leto's yeah. like, oh yeah, I had a rebellious phase. And yeah. Monet was like, quote, rebellious lord you <laughs> end quote and even leto's thoughts mention that he's like genuinely shocked like one of the rare times that he's like genuinely taken aback it's it's great it's like so fun. hilarious it's like finding out your dad has actually smoked weed you know like your ultra christian straight laced dad right it's like yeah no i i smoked a ton of pot <laughs> when i was your age and you're like that can't what? be true. <laughs> what? What part of Catholic communion is that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> it's like the best part <laughs> by a margin. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly like that. It's he's like, oh my god, and also as a rebel, like as a past rebel, to be like, yeah, you held out on me. <laughs> you yeah, understood totally. viscerally what I was doing. Anyway, yeah. So Leto in this moment is like thinking back on his, you know, his shenanigans, and he starts to wax kind of poetic he starts to kind of go off in this tangent mm, mm -hmm. quote i have seen people and their fruitless societies in such repetitive posturings that their nonsense fills me with boredom do you hear end quote hilarious yeah i too have been to times square in new york it's awful <laughs> that's really awful <laughs> right right now, Leto takes a moment to throw some shade at the Romans. He's like, those Love it. fucking Romans. He, like, gets real mad about it. <laughs> he gets super mad about it. And then he does the same internally to all of his, like, Roman ancestors who are yeah. all like, ah, <laughs> that's hilarious. <laughs> Very silly. He gets political and he gets philosophical and he's kind of starting to share his beliefs on this relationship between governments and armies and technology and how all of that intermingles. And we are going to talk about that in our takeaways <laughs> because yeah. those last two pages, those last like three pages, very dense, a lot of really cool things to kind of unpack. Again, Leto is kind of speaking in Frank's voice. So some interesting things there. And we'll talk about those a little bit later. For sure. But this chapter wraps up as Moneo's like, fuck, this meeting is going long. <laughs> <laughs> I got this body to cut up and like bury. I've got like, <laughs> right, right. I have to, present this disassembled laser gun to the Ixian guy who presented, you know, it's like, oh, fuck it. There's a, all yeah, this stuff totally. to do. I'm busy. Got shit to do. I'm his major domo. Like, I've got shit to do. So mm -hmm. he's like, oh, let me go. <clears throat> Let's let me wrap this up. And uh, yep. Yep. Leto's like, yes, <laughs> I'm going to go to my tower and be sad about Duncan. <laughs> like, cool. <laughs> So that's where chapter four wraps up. Moving on to chapter five, let's once again touch on the excerpt at the start here. This one is an inscription on the storehouse at Dar es Balat, and the inscription warns of Leto's pain and boredom. <laughs> and the writing here is basically reinforcing an idea that we've discussed right. before that he only uses his prescience to make sure that the golden path is intact and that he actually doesn't know what this discovery at Dara Spalat that Hadi Benoto and the others have made will actually mean for anything beyond him. Once he is gone, he has not looked into the far future of humanity, into what Hadi Benoto is going to do with his journals and what this discovery will mean. All he's focused on is using prescience in very limited ways to check in on the golden path and make sure the train is still on the tracks. Exactly. Yeah. The inscription also talks about boredom. <laughs> and we have discussed this in the past as well, this idea that knowing the future, knowing absolutely everything about the future is boring. Yeah. It takes all surprise out of life. And Leto himself here says knowing the future, being thought of as a living God, it's mind-numbingly boring. Yeah. And this leads to one of my all-time favorite quotes yes. from this book. Yo, same. Quote, It has occurred to me more than once that holy boredom is good and sufficient reason for the invention of free will 
end quote. Drop the fucking mic, Frank Herbert. Fuck. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> so much better. Then fear, then fear is, is the mind mind killer. killer. <laughs> yes. Oh my god. Oh agreed. Oh agreed. Very much this so. Quote, this quote like gives me chills every time I see it. Yeah. It is an absolutely <laughs> wild and stunning idea considering the things we've discussed on this very podcast about the issues with prescience and free will and yeah. how Paul utilizing his powers to control the future yeah. in many ways effectively takes away all free will and makes him the sole arbiter right. of the future. It It's wild. The one person in the universe making decisions, making choices, yeah. and the idea that this is not just an abstract. It has occurred to me more than once, holy boredom is good and sufficient reason for the invention of free will, is a commentary on his own decision not to be locked in on anything. Yes, 100%. Oh, it's so much better than that fucking overused. <laughs> it's it's great. And it's also yeah. just fascinating to think about a God who's like, I know where, you know, I was thinking about the analogy of Minesweeper is only fun because you have to kind of like figure out what to do next. And if you opened up Minesweeper, and you could just see all the mines. It's like, it's mundanity. It's literally just checking boxes. Right. Holy boredom. Oh, holy boredom. No kidding. <laughs> oh, I love it. Well, on the tail of that fantastic quote and that fantastic idea, we <laughs> rejoined. Oh, boy. Second Duncan of the book. <laughs> yes. Duncan, Idaho. Again. <laughs> to Duncan. To Idaho. <laughs> and this is a new cola as he's awaiting the imperial greeting that he's going to receive now that he's been delivered by the Tleilaxu right. in basically a room in the city of On. No furniture, <laughs> no decor, just a room, a lit mm. room. <laughs> now, this is a fully awakened Duncan. So was a Gola like hate, but his memories were restored through basically being conditioned to kill a Paul like figure who might've been a face dancer, might've been a Gola as well, which is just like a terrifying little aside yeah. included in this chapter. But He's fully awakened, so he has all the memories of Duncan Idaho leading up to his death. And the Tleilaxu have basically given him the TLDR on the last 3,500 years. Yeah. They're like, this happened, and then this happened, and that was fucking crazy. And the whole thing, Duncan's <laughs> like, I don't believe half of that. Are you kidding me? These guys suck. They're the Tleilaxu. I'm not going to trust them. But right. he also doesn't have an alternative, so he... The whole time is kind of going, I trust my senses. I trust what I can see and what I can observe. I have that as like one possibility. If they weren't lying, it's useful to know all of that stuff. But for now, I'm just going to take it one beat at a time. We're also going to talk about in our takeaways, Duncan's memories in particular, because there's right. a little bit there to unpack. But <laughs> one of the funniest moments to me is... <laughs> The Tleilaxu <laughs> tell him all sorts of stuff. They're like, oh yeah, Leto, son of Paul, 23 feet long, five mm -hmm. tons. And Duncan's like, mm-hmm, cool, mm -hmm. cool. Mm -hmm. And they're like, also, this is Arrakis, and it like rains every day. And Duncan's like, uh-huh, mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, okay, I'll believe it when I see it. Yeah, I'll, I'll believe it, sure. And then they're like, by the way, you're going to be greeted by two of the Imperial Guard, these two women. <clears throat> Excuse me? <laughs> Duncan's like, but fucking what? <laughs> women guards yeah god oh what <laughs> it's the only unitalicized word in that thought yeah <laughs> so funny so funny he's he's really rattled about that he's really shaken up he's old-fashioned folks you think yes you he think is. your grandpa has like old-fashioned ideas duncan right. idaho is effectively 3500 years old <laughs> right exactly yeah it's a funny moment and for me it only got funnier when Basically, immediately after that thought, the Imperial Guards arrive, right. who are in fact women, <laughs> yeah. confirming what the Tleilaxu told him. And they enter the room. One of them is unmasked. The other one is wearing an Ixian mask, which we'll talk more about in the Smice Porcels later. Indeed. The unmasked Imperial Guard, named Luli, informs Duncan that Leto wishes for him 
to be the new commander of the Royal Guard, to be their new manager, basically. Right. And that they are here to, A, make sure that Duncan is comfortable and acclimating nicely, but also to double and triple check that the Tleilaxu haven't tampered with this particular Duncan Gola. Right. Yeah. And, you know, there are these shocking revelations for Duncan, but what he's doing throughout this entire conversation is he's just gathering data. Very, mm. very mentat like Duncan. Mm, suspicious. <laughs> suspicious. Now, he's just trying to get as much as he said, he is going to trust his senses. So what is he seeing? What is he experiencing? And he's basically observing these guards. What can he glean from what they're doing, how they're behaving, all of this? He recognizes very quickly the fanatic obedience in these guards, like the way they're talking about their Lord Leto, the God Emperor, is fanatical. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I imagine him being actually a little bit unnerved, like, oh, God, this is... Totally. totally. Duke Leto Atreides would not have loved this. This is a little over the top. But he also recognizes if he had any thoughts of maybe overpowering them. <laughs> mm. He's like the one in the mask. God damn. <laughs> she is built like a wall. Good yeah. Lord. And yeah. in fact, both of them have these knives, these swords on their hips. He's like, I have no doubt in the way they carry themselves that they can handle those things extremely well. Oh yeah. And for a oh, sword yeah. master of Ginaz to be like the way these two people walked into the room convinces me they're great fighters <laughs> yeah you can tell this is like a very genuine assessment this is not an overestimation absolutely he also through all of this and i love this deductive reasoning he says this remarkably giant woman <laughs> has a mask on which means there are other remarkably giant women in the like of similar builds in the imperial guard yeah she yeah, can't yeah. be the only one because if she was the only one there's no reason to give her a mask so the fact that she can wear a mask and it effectively disguises her means that there are these sorts of very physically capable people protecting Leto, which means the same old tensions exist. Leto Atreides, a member of House Atreides, could be attacked, could be assassinated, and he needs right. people to protect him. Oh, I start to see where I fit into this because I yep. am Duncan Leto and I protect and I, you know, support the Atreides. Yep. And that we get this quote, quote, all of this spoke of dangers around Leto, which still required the old and subtle services of spies and an imaginative arsenal of weapons, end quote. Love that. Love it. And I think this conversation with the Imperial Guards yeah. is actually a way to calm Duncan and ease him back into some of that Atreides mindset. Right. Because Luli even says at one point, the God Emperor has a message for you. He loves you as the Atreides have always loved you or something like that. You know, right, I'm paraphrasing. Right. And then here he's extrapolating all this data and realizing they are fanatically loyal to Leto, but this universe doesn't seem all that different yet to me. Like, right. I understand what's happening here. Leto needs guards because of political intrigue. Ah, that's the Imperium that I knew <laughs> and probably hated. So... <laughs> I think like the underlying secondary purpose of this entire chapter and this entire interaction is to calm Duncan and ease him in to his new role and right. to ease him into taking it all of this change that has happened around him. Yeah, totally. Agreed. So this chapter ends when the masked guard determines that Duncan has not been tampered with. Real quick assessment. <laughs> yeah. And the mask guard says, okay, he's good. Green light. Let's bring him to the Citadel. Yeah. And despite his apprehension, as we've discussed, Duncan is feeling relatively secure. Right. He knows, okay, these guards work for an Atreides. I am also about to go meet this Atreides and work for him. That's what I do. I'm Duncan Idaho. I work for the Atreides. You know, he's very much settling back into this role that has defined his life. Right. But I love that you added this to our script because there's a detail here <laughs> at the very end of the chapter yeah. that's very important. You know, it was subtle at first, right? Yeah, totally. Because totally. Luli is like, oh, we were sent here to make sure you're comfortable and happy. Yeah. And I was like, oh, yeah? Comfortable and happy, huh? 
what does that mean? Maybe that's a little spicy. And then at the end, he's like, oh, I would like to bathe because those right. play likes are disgusting and awful. And Luli's like, oh, don't worry. I'll bathe oh, you yeah. myself. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Nothing has changed for our guy, Duncan Idaho. Duncan's like... He still fucks. <laughs> he still fucks. Duncan's like, truly, this universe hasn't changed. People are still throwing themselves at me. God damn, I'm tall and attractive. <laughs> <laughs> incredible Jason Momoa is going to own this role he's the perfect Duncan <laughs> he's the perfect Duncan good lord so good and that's chapter 5 folks that's where we wrap it up on Duncan 5 <laughs> <laughs> indeed so chapter 6 yes. <laughs> now that someone's someone's getting some action it begins with an excerpt that is a passage from the stolen journals as it has been and in this excerpt, Leto talks about how enemies make one stronger and allies weaken. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So, Amtal. <laughs> he's like, hey, remember Amtal? Still a thing. And he speaks to the fact that he's always fending off forces within his empire that are bent on destroying him. And then ending on this ominous note, quote, You who read these words may know full well what actually happened, but I doubt that you understand it, end quote. Who? And that is quite a few people's feeling after reading this book. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> They're totally. like, I know what happened, but <laughs> do I understand it? Uh, yeah. Hmm. And we're about to, you know, kind of in the theme of this little excerpt that starts off the chapter, he's talking about forces opposing one another. We've spent some time now with Duncan and these guards. We've spent some time with Leto and Moneo. We need to see now the force that Leto is opposing, the force that right. Leto is pushing against, that he's being strengthened by, and that he's strengthening. And on that note, we are about to meet some of these forces that are trying to take Leto down. Totally. <laughs> and we're also going to see how, yeah, allies, not always trustworthy. <laughs> oh, yeah. Loyalty is, is not always t fucking topri. God damn it, that God piece of shit. That Corba bastard. <laughs> <laughs> The worst insult I can think of. <laughs> yeah, we should make Korba an official insult, an official <laughs> Gamjabar insult. You Korba. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's talk about chapter six. This one begins as we join Siona, who is sitting in on a boring ass ceremony that Topri is leading. Oh, Topri? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Ugh. That son of a bitch. <laughs> that Topri is leading here for the gathered rebels who are underneath the city of own right now and her mind starts to wander and she thinks back to a certain night where she and topri acquired a chris knife replica from a museum fremen right and we've heard the term museum fremen a couple of times now in these chapters but it's not really until this scene that we start to get a clear picture of what that means and why they're called that. We finally see what has happened to the Fremen in the last 3,500 years. And in short, the Fremen have effectively become this sad and pitiful shade of their former selves. Right. The museum Fremen. The Chris knife itself in this little flashback serves as a metaphor for the museum Fremen. Consider the Fremen Teshar, who has the knife and is selling it to Siona and Topri, consider this quote as he presents it to them. Quote, I guarantee the authenticity of the blade from which we copied it. End quote. <laughs> <laughs> That's so crazy. <laughs> That's so sad. Yeah. It just makes me so sad. He's like, it's authentic. 100% based on a copy. <laughs> That's why it's so expensive. Right. I drew this Mona Lisa for you <laughs> while looking at the real Mona Lisa, okay? I can guarantee Not the even that. There's one Mona Lisa. That's like I drew this picture of a tree looking at a tree. And you're like, but you've never, but I haven't seen a tree. And it's like, yeah. Yeah. It's sad. And, you know, this is a tactic for him to haggle for the price. He ends up getting more out of it than expected. And he clutches that coin purse and rushes away. And you, you can almost kind of imagine 
Tayshar here is like hunched over, you know, like this little gremlin motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. It's honestly kind of a pathetic image. Totally. Of what was once a powerful people who swept across the galaxy in Paul Wadib's name and were at the peak of their power 3,500 right. years ago. And now here they are, just a pathetic, pitiful shell of what they used to be. I do like how Siona doesn't let him get away without like <laughs> giving him like a proper, <laughs> like, we're going to give you the money we have, but like, God, you're so God, pathetic. You're a piece of shit. And man. he's like, no, 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 As he like, runs away. Yeah. Really. You know, you remind me of Korba, man. God, like... you're such a Korba. <laughs> Is your astrological <laughs> sign Korba? Because you're acting Ugh. like a Korba. Yeah. So back to this meeting, to this showing ceremony. Mm -hmm. They're underneath own. And the ceremony concludes. The rebels put on masks. And Topri is like, we have a guest. <laughs> we have a guest speaker. It's Ayo Kobat, who we learn was the one who was responsible for the Lay's gun being delivered to Duncan Idaho. Like, yeah. he's how Duncan got the Lay's gun. Yeah. Now, Kobat mentions, like, oh, yeah, yeah Leto found out about all of that, <laughs> fired <Oops>. me. <laughs> but instead of killing me, he's sending me back to the Ixians with a message. And yeah. what Leto has revealed to me is he knows what we're working on. And mm. the Ix and the Guild and the Sisterhood. Basically, everyone, everyone else in the Imperium, every remaining power structure is working on creating an alternative to spice for space travel. Yeah. Basically. So there's this theory that the Ixians can build a machine that can help guide them through space instead of spice. Right. Basically, making the guild navigators who consume the spice, our boy Johnny. <laughs> yeah. Making him obsolete, you know, taking right. his job away from him giving it to a machine. You know, it's what we're all worried about. It's automation. <laughs> AI. Like, we're going to make some self-driving Teslas. <laughs> right. And, you know, the guild navigators are like, no, oh, wait, 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 wait. Like, you know, we're trying to unionize. We're not trying to <laughs> be fired. <laughs> yeah. It's an interesting prospect because it's not that they're necessarily suggesting computers, which is like why we need spice in the first place and we need all this stuff. Right. They're trying to just find an alternative. They're trying to break that monopoly because in addition to the fact that humans now only live a hundred years, there is also this element of people can't really get around because they have to like fly slowly <laughs> and yep. living a lot shorter means that just isn't an option. And this is part of Leto's kind of forced stagnation. And Leto, rather than killing him, is like, no, no, I know. I know what you're doing. That's fine. Deliver this message for me. Quote, I am to tell my people that they may continue the project only if they send him daily reports on their progress. End ah, quote. Jesus. Leto wow. really is bored. He's out here like literally ordering new HBO shows. He's like, yeah. wait, that sounds interesting. You can keep doing it. You yeah. Know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep trying. Just tell me about it. You know what? I'm down for that remake. Just send me some behind the scenes. Yeah. Done. Go for it. <laughs> They're like, we're going to try to break your power structure. And he's like, cool. That sounds great. Yeah. Uh, the, well, I'm game, bro. Intrigue. And all of you are involved. <laughs> wow. What oh, a, shit. What a stellar cast. I feel like this is really Oscar worthy. Like, this is really, yeah. This is an Oscar contender. Yeah. It is genuinely kind of hilarious. Like, these people are <laughs> trying to subvert Leto's power. Like, secretly in the shadows. Secretly in the shadows. And he's like, yeah, I knew about this, but I'm kind of game for it if you're game you know yeah like, and what's hilarious is siona is kind of like are you a fucking idiot like your machine is not gonna work that's why leto's letting you do it he's <laughs> yeah. all knowing <laughs> you know yeah like he knows it's not gonna work he's amused that you're even trying this is just a joke to him right and she's like utterly skeptical of his <laughs> message he's like kobot you're a moron and the god emperor is just playing you dude right and she lays it out for him. She's like, look, the actual message that Leto is trying to convey here is that he wants the Ixians to continue cheating the guild and the sisterhood out of spice on this fool's errand. <laughs> Kobat's like, we're, 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 we're not doing that. That's not something <laughs> right. Where she's like, stop. <laughs> God damn it. You're so yeah. like Korba. <laughs> you are so annoying. Totally. 
I mean, she's honestly like gets more and more fed up with him throughout the course of this chapter. Right. And the reality is that, yeah, the Ixians are charging the guild and the sisterhood some amount of spice as part of this project. Spice is exchanging hands. And she's like, yeah, Leto just wants you guys to continue wasting your spice on this dumb project. <laughs> right. And she sort of gets to the business at hand. She's like, okay, okay, anyway, whatever. Here's a package I need you to deliver since you're on your way back to X. And the package contains copies of the stolen journal. Right. And she explains to him, hey, Ixians, we need your help. Use your technology. Help us translate this. So Kobat is getting more and more defensive here. He's kind of annoyed that he's being treated like an errand boy for Siona. And he brings up the topic of Leto's prescience, right? right? He's like, well, if you're here giving me this journal, doesn't that mean Leto's also playing you? That he wanted you to find the journal? And he starts talking about the oral histories and what it says about the God Emperor's powers and what it says about the Atreides. And he calls out the fact that Leto always allows the Atreides this rebellious phase right. before they all inevitably end up joining him. Look <laughs> yeah. at what happened to your father, Siona. Yeah. And what Kobat's basically getting at without saying it, he kind of cuts himself off and catches himself in his anger. But what he's getting at is, Siona, is Leto playing you as well? Right. Just like he did your father. Will you end up working for the god emperor that you're rebelling against? Yeah. Because your father did. Like the one who killed your 10 friends as you yeah. like got this thing, you're going to join him. And I don't believe your conviction and I don't believe you're going to succeed. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, like in the context of even what we know, what these characters don't know, but we know Siona does play some role in Leto's plans. Right. And we also know Leto's philosophy on how he treats rebellions, right? right? Use the best of what they have to offer. That's how you dispel a rebellion. Right. Meet them at the table. It's fascinating to see how this relationship will play out. Will Siona actually be the rebel to take down the God Emperor, or will she follow the path that many Atreides before her have and ultimately end up working for Leto too? Find out on the next episode of <laughs> Dragon Ball Z. <laughs> Siona's latest transformation. <laughs> this isn't even Leto's final form. <laughs> oh, hell yeah. Now, interestingly, Siona kind of gets it. Like, yeah, she obviously is not super happy to have him talking this way, but she's like, yeah, he may know. I suspect he knows that I stole the journals. I suspect he knows that all this stuff happened. But like, we can't do anything about that. <laughs> like, fun fact. Yeah, that doesn't change anything. <laughs> we just have to move forward. Are you going to translate these or do we have to kill you? And right. it's really a cool scene because we see how competent and smart Siona is in handling this guy because he comes in like look at these kids playing their little games she's wearing a mask I can tell it's you and she's like yeah I didn't even like the mask what's up dude let's like oh yeah talk it's great and so she's like hey <laughs> fellas lock the door Nayla amazing stand by him and he's like fuck <laughs> what's happening <laughs> she's like I know you have another secret message I know that Leto gave you a second thing. Mm -hmm, what mm -hmm. is that? And finally, he gives up the goods. He spills the beans, the Ixian beans. He spills them all over the on floor. Basically, Leto needs the newest model of Royal Cart Pro Max oh, <laughs> with okay. three camera Bigger lenses, screen. more cup holders, <laughs> surround sound speakers. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Basically, he's growing. Right. Also, he needs like a fresh ream of Redulian crystal paper because he's right. he's been journaling. He has been oh, scrapbooking yeah. constantly. He's like, this is the time I crushed his lungs. And <laughs> <laughs> here's the picture of the body. You know, he's making Jesus. a cute little journal and he's like, I need more paper. I need more Redulian crystal paper. And in addition to this, we get one final bit of revelation from Kobat. Yeah. And that is he has a replacement. And the replacement is on their way. And that replacement is named Hui Nuri. Mm. Hui Nuri. What a name. What a name. I wonder if we'll meet that character. <laughs> Who knows? We'll have to find out. We'll have to find out. 
on the next episode of Dragon Ball Z. <laughs> <laughs> when Leto finally goes super. <laughs> So let's wrap up this chapter and today's reading. Chapter six ends as Kobat leaves. He gets the hell out of Dodge. (laughs) Yeah. And Siona turns her attention to Topri, that slimy (laughs) motherfucker. Yeah. Topri is rightfully shitting his pants because he's basically been caught. Right. Kobat's actions have confirmed for Siona that the two colluded before they arrived and that Topri can no longer be trusted because he is working for her father, Moneo. Right. So she basically exiles Topri from the rebellion. <laughs> on the spot. She's like, hey, on the spot. get out, don't come back. He's like, but, yeah. but, but, get out. It's incredible. Back. It's very clear that Siona is in charge of this rebellion. Right. Even if she's not the leader, I guess, she is effectively in charge. People respect her decisions. And she's very competent and self-assured all throughout this chapter. Totally. And she has recognized in this whole interaction with the ambassador, with Topri, that all of this was perhaps a subtle challenge from the god emperor himself. Yeah. Leto too said, bring it on. And Siona says, quote, Topri, I too can send a message. Tell my father to inform the worm that we accept. End (laughs) quote. She definitely did not literally put on sunglasses. <laughs> Figuratively. Yeah. She put on some cool fucking sunglasses, right? As Hell she said yeah. that. Hell <laughs> was, yeah. There was an electric guitar riff. It was so <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah. It's genuinely kind of a badass moment. Yeah. She's basically just saying, oh, Leto 2, you want to throw hands? Let's fucking go. Meet me in the ring. Catch me outside, bro. Cash me outside. <laughs> Incredible. And that's where we wrap up chapter six and the three chapters for this episode's reading. Indeed. So we're going to get into our takeaways, our key takeaways from today's reading. But before we do that, we're going to take a quick break. So stick around. We've got some insights to share <laughs> right after this. <laughs> Welcome back, folks. It's now time for our key takeaways from today's chapters. Right. First up, for takeaway number one, we wanted to chat about some of Leto's internal thoughts at the end of chapter four. Yeah. He shares a lot regarding the myth of government and the dangerous relationship between the government and the army and the army and technology and what all of that could mean. And as we discussed in the last episode, a lot of this book is going to include political, philosophical musings from Leto, honestly, in the voice of Frank. You know, a lot of this is also Frank sort of doing meta commentary through the voice of his main character, Leto. So it's worth examining what exactly is being said here by Leto, what Frank means by it, and to unpack some of the philosophy and political commentary taking place. Yeah, I'll also be upfront about this. When I see criticisms of this book, I'm just going to be honest, this is one of them. That it's a lot of him thinking about this stuff. Oh, yes. But yep. what has struck me, especially rereading the book, is how what Frank is creating is a dialogue between Leto's beliefs and thoughts about government and philosophy and thus Frank's beliefs and thoughts about those same things and the actual right. events of the book. There is a conversation yes. between Leto's internal understanding and how he explains things and what we are seeing happen. So in the same way that Dune is as much about characters dying left and right and blah, 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 as it is about fate. And if you can control your own destiny and Amtal and all of those bigger, broader themes, This book is about Leto's thoughts and how they engage with the plot as it's playing out. So that doesn't make it any (laughs) less dense and that doesn't make it any like more immediately parsable. And there will be chapters that you read and go, I I don't know what that was supposed to tell me. (laughs) A hundred percent. And that's okay. In the same way that when I read Dune for the first time, I was like, wow, this first 
40 pages makes no fucking sense. And that's okay because it's not necessarily supposed to on the first go. Totally, totally. And we'll be here to do our best to guide you through some of the dense parts. But as always, we'll be here also sharing our interpretations of those dense yeah. parts and the magic of this book, the magic of Frank's writing in the Dune universe is that everything means 12 different things to 12 different people. So let's talk about some of Leto's thoughts about governments and armies and technology. Right. Leto begins by telling Moneo that they are both myth killers and that they both share a certain dream. Right. Now, what is this dream exactly? Presumably, the dream is to end the ancient myth of government, as Leto puts it, and to destroy these old ways of thinking. And for our purposes, we can effectively think of that as battling stagnation, very in line with a core theme of Dune. Leto, and you know, slash Frank through Leto, <laughs> right, right. explains to Moneo why this is necessary, why this dream is required. Quote, that man machine, the army, created our present dream, my friend. End quote. What deliberate language, by the way. The man right. machine that is army, right? Like we talk about the military industrial complex. Yeah. We talk yeah. about this very inhuman thing that is armies and the military. And referring to armies as man machines in a post butlerian universe. Ooh. Poignant. It's Poignant. such a condemnation of the concept, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. That word choice is very intentional there. Now, Moneo, for his part, has clearly heard this lecture once or <laughs> twice before. Yeah. And he grows a little bit impatient. But ignoring that, Leto's inner thoughts continue, despite Moneo's impatience. And Leto thinks, quote, Moneo understands about armies. He knows it was a fool's dream that armies were the basic instrument of governance. End quote. Yeah. And my sort of takeaway here is that Leto is seemingly claiming that governments or power structures or groups who wield force, who wield armies, who wield weapons to enforce their power are undesirable, basically. Right. And that it's perhaps part of Leto's plan, the golden path, the dream, you could say, to end that pattern in human history. For a majority of human history, any group that has attained power has most likely done that through violence, through the use of military might in some capacity. Yeah, I was going to say, you have a ruling party, you have the governing party, and if they are using an army as the basic instrument, armies, which are conflict, they are, they are violence. Like they are, they are yeah. the potential for violence incarnate as the basic instrument of governance. We're right. talking about exactly what Leto told Moneo earlier in this chapter. He's a friend of rebellion. He says, we take the best of what they have to offer. And even the first Duncan, who's grilling him, going, what do we do about this new cult? And Leto's like, what do you mean do about it? Right. Are you suggesting I govern with military force? Right. That's a fool's dream. The reality is you take the best of what they have to offer. You adapt, you grow, you change. You don't say my idea, my governance, what I have achieved is so right that I will kill you rather than adapt and change and Absolutely. Evolve. Yeah, totally. It's a condemnation of military might and force in every way. <laughs> and obviously we can hear Frank's voice all throughout this as well. Now, continuing with this idea, it's taken a step further as Leto observes Moneo walk over to that laser gun and start to dismantle it. And he starts to think about how armies are intrinsically tied to the evolution of dangerous technologies. If you have an army, you will inevitably create or be tempted to create dangerous tech. Right. And Leto considers how, based on his infinite human experience, he knows that armies 
always bite off more than they can chew. Quote, in its guts, the army knows it is the sorcerer's apprentice. It unleashes technology and never again can the magic be stuffed back into the bottle. I teach them another magic. End quote. It's worth noting here quickly that he's using army capital A. Yes. He's not just saying army. He's saying this idea, this like tool, this basic governance thing, this army unleashes these things. And I think about, there's a whole little breakdown and I thought it was beautiful, beautifully said. We don't have it here, but it's okay. The idea of like ultimate destructive power starts in the hands of many. And then it like kind of filters down until it's in the hands of one ultimately. Yes. And this is yep. as Monet is picking up the laser gun. And I can't help but think about Messiah. And I can't help but think about a small group of rebels who blinded hundreds of Fremen with the stone burner and how a small group of rebels could have destroyed the planet if they yep. had miscalibrated that weapon. And that is a byproduct of army capital A. Yeah. A band byproduct, by the way, that still got used. The band <laughs> yeah. didn't matter. <laughs> right. It still got used. And actually still got used because how was Paul's Kizarate handling rebellion? How was Paul's Kizarate governing? Right. It was governing through army. It was governing through quelling rebellions. It was governing through violence. Yes. Our guy, Bronzo of Ix, in jail. Bronzo of Just Ix. for tweeting some <laughs> shit. <laughs> for just for tweeting he twitted and then was put in jail <laughs> twitted not acquitted <laughs> it's absurd yeah it's so funny because again this is all very dense but it is a commentary also on like what muadib did wrong yeah and not that paul had a choice right like we all know after dune right. and dune messiah and after children of dune and him talking to leto he didn't really have that much choice this was avoiding the worst case scenario. This was the yeah. devil that we know. But yeah, still, totally. it's so interesting to see all of these patterns in the previous Dune books, because this is Frank talking about the real world as well, but he's commenting on historical events that have happened in his novels. And it's just fascinating. It's fascinating to hear Leto's thoughts on these events. Yeah, completely. And actually, Speaking of real world events that Frank may be commenting on, to me, <laughs> yeah. much like this is a condemnation of the stone burner, perhaps, right. this also reads to me as an unequivocal condemnation of nuclear weapons. Yes. Like thinking back to the era that Frank would have grown up in, the era that Frank would have written these stories in, he saw the effects of two nuclear superpowers right. butting heads for decades. And to me, this passage and these ideas feel like a real commentary from Frank on the Cold War, on nuclear weapons. He was in his 20s when the nuclear bombs went off Yeah, in Japan. Right. So to your point, 100%. He lived through it. And I mentioned stone burners kind of on a whim, but that's effectively one of the atomics of the Dune universe. Yes. So I think you're... <laughs> a thousand percent right yeah he's talking about these powers at play and the things that have happened in in his life in his lifetime totally and again speaking of letting the genie out of the bottle right like once nukes came into play human history changed forever you know <laughs> yeah. our real modern human history changed forever we crossed the rubicon there's no going back <sighs> yeah and to, to me frank is basically saying like we fucking let the genie of nuclear weapons out of the bottle and armies will continue to tamper with something that they cannot control. So Leto in his thinking and his thoughts, and this was so fascinating to me because I mentioned it in our summaries. He's talking to Moneo. He's talking out loud. He's thinking to himself and he's also speaking inwardly to his, you know, millions of yeah. inner lives. Yeah. And as he continues to sort of like talk through his thoughts on technology and how it breeds anarchy and how, again, especially with army at play as one of these basic tools of governance, how tenuous that is, how easy that is to upset with one of these genies that you've let out of the bottle, right? Yeah, totally. All it takes is this thing done by this small group of people to 
take everything down. He's really highlighting how that opens the floodgates to profound violence. And Moneo kind of jokingly mentions, oh yeah, there's these rumors of, quote, another jihad against such things, end quote, and how that's brewing on different planets. But the paradox there, and this is kind of amusing, is as Leto kind of tells his restless inner voices, he says, quote, jihads create armies. The mm. Butlerian jihad tried to rid our universe of machines which simulate the mind of man. The Butlerians left armies in their wake, and the Ixians still make questionable devices. End quote. Like, it's almost how he shut down those inner voices who were saying, we are not aristocrats. And he's like, yeah, but you failed, right? You right. rebels, ultimately, at the end of the day, you failed. The Butlerian right. Jihad was intended to remove this element of society, this dangerous technology. And yet, <laughs> despite all the violence, despite your capital A army approach to just destroy, 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 kill, kill, kill. Well, the result... The Ixians are still fucking making things. So <laughs> right. sorry. Sorry you failed. Right. They're going to ship me a new model of it next week. <laughs> yeah. I ordered three. Cry about <laughs> it. <laughs> I'll do an unboxing on my YouTube channel. I'll do an unboxing. <laughs> Moneo's my only <laughs> subscriber, but he always <laughs> thumbs up and he always uns and then subscribes again so that he can smash yeah. that button. <laughs> yeah. I, lo I love this point because Leto is basically making it clear that the Butlerian Jihad and Jihads in general, much like his father's Jihad, are not the way to solve these issues. No. If you have a problem with technology like laser guns or whatever, thinking machines, creating an army will only result in more dangerous technology being created because of that intrinsic relationship right. between government, power, armies, and technology. Right. And- Leto's thesis seems like pretty clear here. Like I could dumb it down and simplify it and summarize all of this by saying, don't hate the player, hate the game. <laughs> yeah. As he famously said <laughs> to Moneo. Yeah. Which Leto puts a little more eloquently, quote, what is anathema? The motivation to ravage no matter the instrument, end quote. The Lays gun is not the problem. Right. It is the mindset behind why the Lays gun got made in the first place. That is the problem. <sighs> snaps, snaps, snaps for you. My God, Beautiful. my God, Emperor. My God, Emperor. Also, quick aside, someone send this episode to Brian Herbert because this is <laughs> this is what's wrong with the prequels. Yes. It's not about the technology. It's about the mindset. And the mindset is what's dangerous. The mindset is that of stagnation, is of seeking comfort. It's the mindset that seeks comfort, that weakens you. It's the mindset that acknowledges the need for adversity, that strengthens you. It's all related. It's all interrelated. Yes. And this is a masterclass on how technology and how this continued development of technology for a very specific, very violent purpose will not precede humanity's interests. Yeah. It's just it's just great. Uh, this is like two pages, by the way. <laughs> two and a half pages <laughs> of this fucking book. <laughs> Welcome to God Emperor of Dune. In a, in a big way, uh, this is kind of at the heart of the book. So Completely. Again, completely. I did not get any of this the first time I read the book. I thought, no, oh, that was kind no. of a confusing chapter. Moving on. <laughs> wow. Topri sucks. You know, and like that was it. Yeah. This is also why I love this book club, because we get to take the time to have these conversations. Yeah. It forces me to read and reread and then listen to the audiobook and then read it again. You know, read these chapters like four times back to back to back. Right. And then I finally have a breakthrough where I'm like, oh, shit, I didn't yeah. notice this the last seven times I read these words. So to wrap up the first takeaway, I know it's been very dense. Yeah. And... We've gone through history and technology and nuclear weapons and stone burners. But I think in summary, like if you're going to take anything away from this discussion, what Leto is basically trying to do with this golden path and the message that Frank is trying to convey through that is that humanity needs to stop thinking that army plus technology equals power. Governments need to stop using that formula. Leto is saying that is a stagnant way of thinking about power 
and governments and rulers. And his plan via the golden path is to change that equation. Right. A new magic, so to speak. A new magic. It's fascinating. It's just so good. I love that idea. Armies as the main basic tool of governance. What a, oh, it's so good. Anyway, it's great. my parents are from, like, I'm from Berkeley, California. This is so far up my alley, it's obscene. <laughs> anyway, next takeaway. And for this, mm -hmm. we're going to talk about Duncan. We're going to talk about Duncan, I know. Yes. And you might be like, which one? The living one, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> All of the dead ones. No, no, no. Not interested in that. Yeah. We did a whole episode on the dead ones, if you're interested. Go listen to <laughs> we that. We did. Some of them are great. I like Clumsy Duncan. I like Lady Duncan. Lady Duncan. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So anyway, we have learned so far that at least nine Duncans have been killed by Leto and 19 have died by, quote, natural deaths, end quote, which... Mm. Okay. Uh, okay. Sure. <laughs> and then we literally watch Leto use tackle on a Duncan. <laughs> and it's super effective. It's super effective. Crushes his whole rib cage. He is just there dying on the floor. That is Onyx yeah. tackling Caterpie. Which oh yeah. Actually, after I say that, I'm like, Onyx is like not a bad analogy for, for Leto. Oh, yeah. But all of this leads us to the newest Duncan in chapter five. And it's interesting because so his memories have been restored, right? He is yes. Duncan Idaho. He's not hate, he's not some Gola with the skills of Duncan. He is Duncan. But in his chapter, he thinks about things and remembers things that are a little bit confusing. So what we wanted yeah. to do is talk about these and talk through a couple of possibilities. So specifically the memory that <laughs> kind of begins the conversation is he remembers, quote, a strange child, twins, really, Leto and Ganima, Paul's children, the children of Chani, who had died delivering them, end quote. Cool. And you're like, wait, 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 hey, <laughs> wait. Duncan died in the ecological testing station so that right. Paul and Jessica could escape with Liet Kynes. Yeah. He is nowhere near Leto and Ganema. Like he is yes. nowhere near that. If this is a Gola of that first Duncan Idaho, the way hate was, he shouldn't have those memories. He just shouldn't have them. Right. He should remember nothing past Denny Villeneuve's Dune part one. Right. Basically. Oh, exactly. <laughs> Perfectly said. Yeah. Yeah. And there are a couple of possibilities that like begin to maybe explain this. The first is that Frank fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> the first possibility is Frank was like, hey, listen, I kind of just want him to have those memories. If you're really going to pick nits on this, you're the asshole. Right. It's a book. Don't take it so seriously. I just yep. spent three chapters talking about governance <laughs> and like <laughs> lays guns and technology. So you yeah. know, chill. And it certainly happened before, right? Like the Pardo kinds, Liet kinds mix up. It's happened. Right. But the second possibility and the one that we wanted to talk about, because we think this actually carries some water. Frank intended for us quietly to understand that this Duncan is actually a Gola of hate is actually mm. a Gola of the Duncan that dies in Children of Dune, who is killed by Stilgar in Siege to Burr. Right. And that's what we wanted to talk about. Yeah. And that raises a couple of its own questions. <laughs> right. <laughs> because obviously this Gola has no immediate Mentat capabilities, even though hate very clearly does, right? Recall that hate was trained both as a Mentat and a Zen Sunni philosopher, right. and very much did both of those things <laughs> in Dune Messiah and Children of Dune. Very obviously. Like, very like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> very much like someone who knows how to juggle has never once been asked to demonstrate, but has demonstrated, right. you know, like, yes. has been like, oh, you guys probably want to see me do this. <laughs> He's right. like, totally. You want to hear some Zen Sunni stuff, right? And everyone's like, no, right. no, no we're really, we're, we're, we're fine. He's like, okay, so basically. <laughs> exactly. It's, like how a Harvard grad will always tell you they graduated from Harvard. <laughs> right. If they did it, they'll tell you and you'll know. Right. And so hate, of course, was a mentat, was a Zen Sunni philosopher, and in Messiah and Children of Dune, we knew he used both of those capabilities. Right. Here, he's not. 
And there's a couple of potential explanations for why. One is the possibility that maybe Mentat skills are something that has to be conditioned from childhood or from birth, regardless of genetics or aptitude. So you can't right. just be born a Mentat and know Mentat things. Right. It's something you work years at, perhaps. So that could mean that this current Duncan that we meet in chapter five today actually does have all the capacity to be a Mentat, but hasn't gone through the rigorous training and discipline to be able to process data in the way that a Mentat can. So possibility two is that we know from the Dune Encyclopedia that one of the previous Duncans was delivered to Leto, trained as a Mentat. Right. And Leto immediately killed him, like on site. Upon delivery, <laughs> is what it says in the, he's like, Amazing. here's your Duncan. And he's like, fucking excuse me, and kills right. him. Right, he does the unboxing live on YouTube and then kills him. And in this chapter from today's reading, the masked Imperial Guard tells Duncan that, quote, the dirty Tleilaxu have tried it only once and they paid dearly for their mistake, end quote. Right. as in tampering with the Duncans. Right. So taking those two data points and kind of putting them together, maybe the Tleilaxu have learned their lesson and have removed the Mentat training from this Duncan. Like this Duncan is perhaps hate, still has that Mentat and Zensuni training, and out of fear of what Leto may do, they have either tamped it down or removed that training altogether. Or they have like suppressed it, right? In the same way that that first possibility is just that it requires like explicit training. Maybe they've just been like, you might have these thoughts, you might have these skills. We're not dealing with those. Right. Skip the training. So that's possibility number two, is that this is an intentional choice from the Tleilaxu because they know it'll piss <laughs> Leto too off. Yeah, I mean, we know he banned Mentats. So even <laughs> if this Duncan has Mentat training, the Tleilaxu are not going to be like, here's your Mentat hate. <laughs> it's like, yeah. no, it's not not on the level. Right. And about all this, to be clear, this is not set in stone. Like, we've seen some very spirited discussion online about this. And I've heard a few different theories that may not be 100% solid, but are kind of fun as like thought experiments. Mm -hmm. thought exercises and actually this one user on a web page uh, jackarudu user georgie denbro posed a particularly compelling theory about how early golas were effectively regeneration you take the old yeah. body you know maybe it's missing its head it had a sword through the heart whatever like however it died whatever dismemberment happened you take the body you put it in a vat you regenerate it and bring it back. And the idea of taking just cells of just pieces of a body and growing a whole new body from that didn't evolve until later. Right. So Georgie's idea is that basically thus current Golas would be created from the original body of Duncan, right? Quote, when we now learn that this Duncan was made from cells from the original, air quotes, original Duncan, we should remember that hate was the original Duncan just brought back to life and retrained while he didn't have his memories, end quote. Right. Like literally the original body. It is the same body. <laughs> yeah. Just regrown, you know. And this theory is actually backed by the Dune Encyclopedia. Mm -hmm. It tells us, quote, the early golas were produced by tissue regeneration requiring immediate cryotransport of complete cadavers to the axolotl tanks of the Tleilax, end quote. Yeah. And then the idea being that this tech evolved in the thousands of years since Dune Messiah. Quote, by the fifth century of Leto's reign, the method of making golas had radically changed. Instead of regenerating original flesh, the Tleilaxu cloned their later products, end quote. So the idea being, okay, Duncan died in the ecological testing station. That body was recovered by Sardaukar soldiers, as we know, and sold to the Tleilax. They took that body of Duncan, 
put it in the axolotl tank, mm -hmm. rejuvenated it, and then after Hate died in Children of Dune, then perhaps they started taking samples. Like, okay, we're going to take his arm. <laughs> we're just going to regrow a Duncan from the arm. One big old beautiful arm. It's grown. And it worked. And they're like, hell yeah. And then they refined and refined and refined yeah. to the point that they could then say, we've got an ice box back there <laughs> with like, you know, 130 pounds of Duncan. We just scrape off some skin cells, toss them in a tank, grow a new Duncan. Right. And that's our new Gola process. Right. The technology evolves to that point. Right. You can imagine like for the first couple hundred years, they're still kind of like reusing the same body over and over again. You know, <laughs> like they got one water bottle and they're fucking refilling it <laughs> over and over for a hundred years. Before someone's like, time for Come a on. new water bottle. But God. buy a swell, <laughs> buy a swell bottle, not sponsored. Yeah, I love this theory. I, I think Georgie is spot on. Yeah, same. I think it was the original body from the ecological testing chamber. I think it is hate that had to be reused over and over, and over the thousands of years between books. Sure, that technology finally evolved to where they don't need to reuse the body anymore, and they just scrape off a couple of skin cells or hair or whatever and use that. But this lends credence to the idea that this Duncan would retain the memories of the original body that was used over and over, and thus would retain right. the memories of hate all the way through Children of Dune. Yeah. And I think ultimately that's where you and I fall on this theory. Right. Like none of these theories are 100% bulletproof. Like Georgie's idea still doesn't prove definitively why he's not a mentat, why he's not a Zen Sunni philosopher. But I think it's sound enough that you and I at least believe this was intentional from Frank. Frank wrote this Duncan as if it were a regrown hate and thus would have the memories of books one, two, and three. So that's takeaway two, some analysis of this Duncan Gola's memories and perhaps some of the inconsistencies and the theories that hopefully duct tape that together. Right. So we are now, I think I heard something in the kitchen, Leo. Oh, what? We are now at the point where it's time to <laughs> chop down on some delicious spice morsels, folks. Are you sure it wasn't a crowbat? <laughs> <laughs> so before we dig in, Let's take another quick break, but don't go anywhere, dear listener, because we'll be back with a plate full of morsels. Mm. We'll see you in a minute. Welcome back, everybody. We hope you dodged any potential crowbat attacks as we com <laughs> compared cobat to corba. <laughs> so confusing. <laughs> Let's jump into our first morsel today, which is the Cybus Hood. So in this episode's reading, one of the two Imperial Guards, the friend, is masked and is wearing something described as the Cybus Hood. So the Dune Encyclopedia tells us all about this. And as the story goes, the Emperor, Shest Ten Carino, <laughs> who only reigned for one year. Oh my God. He was emperor of the entire universe for one year from hilarious <laughs> from 9,731 to 9,732 AG. Yep. That's a year. <laughs> that's a year. Do the math. <laughs> that's one calendar year, one standard year. He took the throne in spite of the fact that multiple factions were like, yo, we're going to assassinate you. We are one. We are all we're going to kill you. We are going to kill you. He was like, okay, okay, I hear you. I'm going to take power and I'm going to do everything in my power not to be assassinated. And as part of his desire to live or whatever, he, Ugh. <laughs> Ugh, cringe, how chuggy, <laughs> how chuggy of you. <laughs> he actually commissioned Ix. He was like, hey, Ix, can you make me devices and technologies to help me survive with these assassins after me? And the Cybus Hood was one of those technologies. It was developed within his first, his only, year of rule, mm -hmm. almost 500 years before the beginning of Dune. 
Wow. Like 500 years before House Atreides moves to Arrakis, right? Yeah. And he got assassinated anyway. Oh, no. <laughs> That's why his rule is so short. He died. <laughs> but his death aside, the hood was a hit. People loved the hood. And we get a few more details about this. Basically, it's manufacturing and its popularity. Yeah. The hood, the Cybus hood, is described as a, quote, purposely shapeless sack of deepest black material, end quote. Manufactured with that Ixian secret sauce that literally no one could crack. People, like thousands of years later, people have no idea how they did it. The cloth absorbs all visible light, but also, and this is crazy, all known forms of radiation. Okay. Side note, does that mean the Cybus Hood would protect against stone burners? Ooh. J-waves are a form of known radiation. So your eyes would be protected, potentially. There's a couple of assassins <laughs> in that like old quarter, and they're like, whoo, <laughs> I am glad I was wearing my Dodged Simon. a bullet. Dodged a bullet there. Honey, I told you I should have <laughs> wear this all the time. I, <laughs> I go to bed with my Simon's hood. <laughs> I'd be wearing that 24-7 <laughs> in case I- It's the tinfoil hat of the <laughs> Dune universe. <laughs> I'm going to put on my- Conspiracy Cybus Hood for a second. <laughs> Excellent. Wow, that's fascinating. That is my new survival strategy yeah. for stone oh, yeah. Cybus Hoods. Well, even if you used like x ray or an MRI or something, you couldn't actually get through a Cybus Hood. Very, very yeah. impressive stuff. The most popular theory for the secret sauce, how they did it, involves chemicals that the guild uses to create their heat shields. So the guild having to have ships that kind of come and go through things. Their heat shields are made with a chemical treatment. A theory is that those same chemicals are used. But of course, the Ixians aren't confirming or denying that theory. Right. Poker face. Yeah. They're like, oh, interesting. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and that's it. Yep. Now, we do know that some property of the Cybus Hood material, the cloth, limits its scalability. So it works very well for like a personal hood. But there was, quote, a sharp decrease in concealing power first observed when hoods larger than those needed to fit the average human head were manufactured, end quote. Which basically shot down any possibility of this cloth being applied to ships. Ornithopters couldn't be draped in this, right? This couldn't yeah. be draped hilariously over a highlighter. <laughs> this is a limited scale material technology i also like the implication that if you have a larger than average size head <laughs> it doesn't right. work as well for you that's the exact joke i was just waiting to make <laughs> love it they're like i'm sorry you have a big noggin right sorry to tell right you. big noggin nick you're out of luck buddy <laughs> oh man <laughs> not, not again <laughs> you got a melon nick i don't know what to tell you <laughs> you got a pumpkin on those shoulders boy <laughs> you'll never be an assassin Oh, man, I just want to kill. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Nick. Well, listen, Nick aside, the hood, <laughs> quote, went on to become one of Ix's most popular exports, end quote, and, quote, became standard issue for assassins and spies, end quote, wow. which is okay. fucking incredible because let's circle back. The reason they exist is because of poor old Shest Carino, who was like, I don't want to die. Help me protect myself against assassins right. and spies by making this. And the Ixians accidentally made the best tool for assassins and spies. Right. Genie's out of the bottle, baby. Oh, what a tie-in. What a bow. Spectacular. <laughs> Incredible. Thank you once again to the Dune Encyclopedia. What a spectacular. For telling us way more than we needed to know <laughs> Love about it. the Cybersid. Love it. <laughs> All righty. Morsel number two today. Yes. Is about our muscle mommy, <gasps> Nayla. Nayla Goals. Whose last name is apparently Nykalist. Nayla Nykalist. Yeah. So we wish we could spend the next hour and a half telling you everything we learned about Nayla. <laughs> in the Dune Encyclopedia We're going because to. <laughs> there is so much. Yeah. But 
that would get into spoiler territory, obviously. True. And instead, we'll save that for a potential future episode about Nayla, where we talk in depth about her. What we instead want to do for this morsel is just share some fun, spoiler-free details about her background that the Dune Encyclopedia fills in for us. Yeah. So what the encyclopedia tells us is that Nayla Nakalist was born in 13,689 AG and is about 38 years old when we meet her in this book, in God Emperor of Dune. Hell yeah. Someone older than me? That's great. Great news. <laughs> <laughs> An even older crow. <laughs> <laughs> So Nayla was born on the planet Grumman in a fish speaker school to an officer, Kellyst, and her consort, Pavel Maris. Right. And Nayla very much took after her mother. From early childhood, she excelled in all things physical. She was a powerhouse from an early age, yeah. even by fish speaker standards. And in grade school, we're told that she actually got top marks in two classes in particular. And this will surprise nobody. <laughs> Religion and gym class, basically any <laughs> physical physical class. Yeah. Outside of that, though, she was pretty unremarkable, academically speaking. Now, when she graduates in 13,705 AG, Leto receives his usual report on the graduates, and he is immediately interested in this fanatical newcomer, right? this Nayla. And so he gives her a task. He says, Nayla, you are assigned to join the garrison on the Bene Gesserit planet Wallach 9. Cool. And the Bene Gesserit yeah. spent the next 15 years <laughs> trying to crack Nayla's loyalty to the God Emperor. Yeah. And you know what happens? <laughs> they fucking fail. Hell yeah, Nayla? <laughs> Incredible. The yeah. Bene Gesserit could not break this woman and her devotion. To Leto 2. You know, talk about Amtal, by the way. Leto 2 is like, we need to test her loyalty. <laughs> Put her with the Benny Jesuit right. for 15 years. <laughs> Incredible. Incredible. And she clearly passed that test because yeah. this earns her a promotion to lieutenant. And she gets transferred around a little bit. She earns a couple more promotions. There's more story to tell here that we'll save for the full episode. Right. But eventually she is summoned to Arrakis where she comes face to face with God himself with <laughs> yeah. Leto too. Yeah. And to really cement her devotion to him. This is genius, a stroke of genius from Leto. I love it. Leto presents Nayla with a literal Chris knife, not a copy, not a museum <laughs> Fremen copy, an actual Chris knife that once belonged to one of Silgar's wives. So not only is it a real deal Chris knife, it has historical weight as well. Right. Amazing stuff. Now, of course, there's much more to Nayla's story. That is just her brief background and how she comes to work with and for the God Emperor and how she's embedded with Siona. We will get much deeper into Nayla in that future episode right. about her. And we will talk about her wild adventures and her promotions and so much more. It's that the Dune Encyclopedia tells us. So much better than I expected. The Dune Encyclopedia <laughs> has five double column pages on Nayla. Insane. I love Insane. it. Insane. It's so good. Well, <laughs> that's it. Ooh, we did we it. We did it. Episode two, we talked about three chapters for looks like right now. Peek behind the curtain. Yeah. Two hours and five minutes. <laughs> My God. So if you're listening to this podcast and you're at like our you know, hour and 10, whatever. That's how much we had to cut to make this like a listenable experience. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. You know what? Maybe we won't cut it, baby. Join us here hey. at the two hour mark. Here's <laughs> yeah. the raw audio mistakes and all. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's pretty bold. <laughs> that's bold. Yeah. That's we like, won't do that. That's John Stewart level, like confidence. He's just, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that's torturous. We wouldn't do that to our listeners. No, never. We will, however, assign homework. Yes. So, here is the homework that y'all have for the next episode. Make sure that you have read chapters seven, eight, and nine, or if your copy is different from ours, read through the chapter that ends on the sentence, quote, the Reverend Mothers, Syaska, Yatob, Mamalut, Eknikosk, 
and a Kelly. End quote. I'm so glad you read that. <laughs> <laughs> Good Lord. I was looking at those names. I was like, mm, two out of four at best. <laughs> and there's six names. <laughs> yeah. So that's your assignment for the next episode, listener. Indeed. Make sure you do it on time. Now, before we let you go, we want to remind you of a few ways to support what we do here at Gum Jabbar. If you like what we do, support us. Why not? <laughs> Make our lives easier. <laughs> and the best way, the best way of all is to become a patron over at patreon.com yes. forward slash Gum Jabbar. You get great benefits, ad-free episodes, weekly bloopers, excerpts. When these episodes run too long and we have to cut stuff, patrons still get them. And you get an invite to our exclusive Discord. If you're hearing this episode and it's not like early 2023, you missed out for months. You can get early access to book clubs as a patron. Think about That's it. That's right. Consider supporting. Indeed. Now, another great way to support us is to get yourself some Dune themed merch from our Jeez. merch store. GamjabarShop.com. If you're looking at the video version of this podcast, Leo is showing off some of our gorgeous t shirt designs. And now he's lifting his shirt. Okay, let's see where this goes. <laughs> <laughs> My desire to okay. yes and very quickly capped out. <laughs> I was like, yes, but uh, actually. <laughs> so grab yourself a t shirt that you can strip tees out of. <laughs> We've also got art, mugs, tote bags, so much more. Go check out that store. It's a great way to support what we do. It's crazy that we're going to post the full striptease on the patron. So, <laughs> on patron, so just so you know. And finally, we love to hear from you, whether it's in reaction to our partially baked theories, in reaction to our analysis and our discussions, or if it's just you, know, you want to tell us what you think of the episodes or your favorite yeah. ice cream flavor or yeah. or how much pulp should go in orange juice. Most, most, always most. <sighs> Gomjabar podcast at gmail.com. <laughs> <laughs> That's the email address. Gomjabar podcast at gmail.com. Send us your thoughts. Tell us why I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> and the most, most. Give me an orange. Give me an orange and make it for <laughs> Just eat an orange then. How dare you? I want to drink an orange. <laughs> <It's> orange. <laughs> well, friends, there is no real ending. It's just the place where you stop the recording. But this podcast is always one step beyond logic. So help spread the word of Muad'Dib and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And be sure to check out the other shows on the War Party Podcast Network on warparty.com. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at war underscore party. Thank you so much for listening. And remember, whoever controls the podcast controls the universe. We'll see you on the golden path.